yet, this week could be a life-changing week for you. You could register tonight with Tracy. She could help you. And you could spend this entire week raising funds, getting hold of this vision. Um, I, I think that's the best way to raise funds is to get everybody personally involved in the work of the Lord. Because how many know we're not just raising money, we're training. Tell your neighbor, we're training. We're training people. And so I'm just so proud of this church, and I'm so proud. And as we close out the week, uh, this Wednesday, we're going to have a, a family time. We'll come in, have a, a worship, a short word, and then we have family time. And we're going to raise some more money for Run for Hope. And, and the beauty is this, is to know that all the funds that we raise are really going towards meeting the need around the world. Right now, there's an enormous explosion getting ready to take place in Panama. Panama. Panama is going to explode. Panama is already one of the biggest churches in all the Latin America churches that we have. And being with Pastor Lane this weekend, he says, I'm going to get that arena, Roberto Duran's arena. I'm going to do a big crusade there with thousands. So they're, they're going to do a youth invasion. I'm, I'm going to send some of our young people. In fact, I'd like to see the Spanish ministry sign up for that Panama invasion. Come on, somebody. And let's go to Panama. Someone, let's go to Panama. And let's make a difference over there in Panama. It's getting ready to explode. So, and we're also still uh, getting ready to open up the different homes, the different homes. So a lot is going on. It's been a busy summer. But church, I want to just tell you, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Look at someone next to you and just tell them, I am proud of you. All right, I'm proud of you. Well, tonight, I want to share a little bit about the vision of our church and share a little bit and bring each and every one of us back into a reminder of what God is doing right here in San Diego. How many of you love your church? Okay. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 54. And many of you have it memorized already, but I want to use it as a foundation of what I want to share tonight. And tonight I'm going to share with you something very important, very, very important if we're going to be able to be that church that God has called us to be. How many know God's given us a destiny? And you know it already. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2 and 3. The Bible says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Do not hold back. Say that with me. Say, do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall what? You shall what? You shall expand or spread out to the right and the left, right? And your descendants will inherit the desolate city. You'll make the desolate city and inherit, your descendants will inherit the desolate cities. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for your word. We thank you for these leaders. We thank you for this church that you've raised up. And I pray, God, that as we hear your word, we begin to understand uh, the challenges before us and understand how we as leaders need to rise up even to a greater dimension and taking on the vision and taking it to a new level. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. The reason I read that scripture to you tonight is because this scripture speaks of the promise that God has placed on our ministry. And that promise is also extended to every church in Victor Outreach, and that's the promise of expansion. That in the beginning, the Lord said he'd give us the treasures out of darkness. You know that very well. But then the Lord says, not only am I going to give you the treasures, but I'm going to expand you all over the world. And I believe as a part of that expansion is not only just a, an expansion in the sense of church growth and in the sense of church planting, but God also wants to expand the lives of people, expand the lives of people. See, to be a part of Victory Outreach is to be a part of a powerful family that moves like an army. Say this with me. Say, we are family. And, and don't underestimate what I'm saying to you. It's to be a part of a powerful family that moves like an army. On Wednesday, I shared with you very simply. I said, you know, some people nowadays when they come to church, they just come looking for a church. There could be some people here like that tonight. You, you know, you're looking for a church. You, you want to come in and, and you want to visit a church or be a, you know, be a part of a church for a week or a little while you know, to get your needs met and to, to just kind of, you know, get a feeling or, 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 or you're looking for a church, you want to be a part of something. But when we became a part of Victor Arch many years ago and we gave our life to God and we got involved in the church, we weren't really there to be a part of a church. We were there to be a part of a vision. We were there to be a part. We joined to be a part 
of a church with a vision, a church with a destiny. Let, let me put it this way. We weren't joining a church. We, were grow, we wanted to join a group of powerful people that were going somewhere. And how many know there's a difference? You can walk into any church and go unnoticed. But when you walk through the doors of Victory Outreach, you're not walking into an ordinary church. That's why a lot of people, when they start out with us, they get saved in Victory Outreach. And then they leave Victory Outreach for a little while and they go to other churches. They say, it's not the same. It's not the same. And many times they find their way back. And the reason they find their way back is because they go over there and they join a church. But to be a part of Victor Outreach is to be a part of a family with power and an anointing and a vision and a purpose. Come on, somebody. How many know we have a special anointing, a special calling? See, there are many people out there. I want you to understand this and hear this very clearly. There are many people out there that want to join with us. They want to join with us. They, they, they look at what God is doing in our ministry and they say something special is happening at Victory Heights San Diego. They hear the testimonies. They hear the miracles. They hear the breakthroughs. They hear how the word is being preached and delivered. They hear the, they feel the spirit and sense it. And, and they, they may not even walk through the doors of Victory Heights, but you know how they feel it? They feel it through you. They feel it through you when you leave and you begin to talk about your church or talk about the vision or talk about the movement of Victory Outreach or even the fact that you're raising money for Run for Hope. They say, what in the world is that? What is that orange shirt? What is that green shirt all about? You don't even, they don't even understand those things. You say, listen, I'm not just a part of a church. I'm a part of a powerful group of people that are making a difference all over the world. Is it true or not? Give God a praise if you know it's true. It's not ordinary. It's not ordinary. And so there's a, a lot of people out there that want to journey with us. They want to be a part of what God is doing. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced of it. No, everywhere I go, they say, you're from Victory Outreach. Yes, I'm, you're, you're a pastor in Victory Outreach. Whoa, I heard a lot about that ministry. I heard that that ministry is great. I heard that ministry is great. I heard that ministry is all over the world. People want to be a part of what God is doing in our midst. So because people want to be a part of it, how many know as leaders, we've got to be ready to receive the harvest. We have to be ready to receive the harvest. I've been feeling this in my spirit because how many know tough times always come for a reason? How many know this has been a tough summer? This has been a summer of, of spiritual opposition in many leaders' lives, many people's lives. There's a, been a spirit of opposition within your life. I came to tell you, God doesn't do anything without purpose. God always has a purpose for the storm. God always has a purpose for the battle. And here's what I believe. I believe God's getting us ready because there's a new harvest getting ready to come to Victory Outreach San Diego. People who are going to journey with us. Not just to be a part of a church, but to experience spiritual growth and to experience spiritual breakthrough within their life. The harvest is coming. So the question we've got to ask ourselves tonight, and this is what I wanted to share with you, this is why I'm up here tonight, is because are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready to receive the harvest? I'll tell you this, we'll never receive the harvest doing business as usual. We'll never receive the harvest doing business as usual. We as the harvesters must be ready for the harvest to come in. See, God's strategy for the church is very clear, and I want you to be reminded of this. You can write this down as well. His strategy for the church is very clear. Number one, his strategy is local. Number two, his strategy is global. So when God looks down from heaven at our church, and, and, and I don't want this to fly over your head here. How many are tuned into what I'm saying? He, he looks down, and he's saying, okay, I raised up that church in San Diego because I have a local strategy. There's a local strategy that I have for that church. And, and what we find in that local strategy to be effective is that we find that God's strategy for the church and for people to grow is that the church was always birthed in people's homes. People's homes. In the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it talks about how they broke bread from house to house, how they had all things in common. How there was a spirit of love. There was a spirit of generosity. There was a care for one another. How many, how many of you read the Bible? How many of you actually read the Bible? How many know the scripture I'm talking about? 
So the church began in the house, in people's homes. See, Sunday morning is simply a celebration. It's just a celebration. When people come to the house of the Lord, they, they need to understand we don't come to get it all. We just come to celebrate the goodness of God. We come to celebrate the goodness of God. We come to hear a word from the Lord. So Sunday morning is a reflection. But what is Sunday morning a reflection of? Re Sunday morning is a reflection of everything we've been doing throughout the entire week. If, if people are not here on Sunday morning, it's because we haven't been meeting needs throughout the week. If people are not here on Sunday morning, it's because we haven't been praying with enough people. We haven't been spending time with enough people. We haven't been winning souls. I've been in a lot of churches lately, guys. And, and I can tell you that when I'm in that green room getting ready to go in to preach, I, I can see the pastor shaking, nervous. You know, you, you need anything, pastor? You need anything? You, know, you, know, you need anything? You want some coffee? You want it? No, I'm good, bro. I'm good. I, I, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, today my, my sound. Okay, yeah, don't worry about it. What are they really scared about? They're really scared if anybody's going to show up that morning. And I'll tell you why. Because they're not sure if their people have been meeting the need throughout the week. See, I, I want you to understand that what we do Monday through Saturday will determine how we celebrate on Sunday. If you've been praying for people, if you've been meeting the needs of people, if you have been talking to people, if you've been hitting the streets, if you've been sharing your faith throughout the week, I'll tell you, on Sunday morning, the house of God should be packed every single time we get together. Why are you not clapping? Is it because you don't like to work? We need leaders that are willing to work. We need leaders that are willing to make a difference here in the city of San Diego. Somebody say amen. amen. See, Sunday morning is simply a celebration of what we've done throughout the week. Sunday night is a night for preparation. Sunday night is where we come to. In the morning, we celebrate. At night, we come to be prepared. How many feel like every time you walk into the family life flow, you're being prepared? How many feel like something good is happening in your life? How many feel like you're being trained, you're being qualified, you're sitting under the teaching you need to go to another level? Well, well Sunday morning is for, is for celebration. Sunday night is for preparation. But where is the real growth, growth taking place? The real growth is taking place from house to house. The, the real growth is taking place in our life groups. How many of you, by lifting up your hand, you have a life group? You're in a life group. Let me see. Oh, wow, a lot of you. Powerful. So if you're in a life group, are you winning souls? Are you winning souls? We, we need a renewed passion to grow our life groups. We need a renewed passion to win new people to Christ. How many can say amen? When we went to Philadelphia, ooh, man, something happened. There's a team here. Are you the same? Are you churchy? You, you were churchy, huh? How many of you were churchy? And then you went out there and you said, oh, man, I was churchy. There's a new fire for souls. There's a new passion to share your faith. There's a new, new passion to get fish in the net. Can I hear an amen? So life group is where we have to look at the local strategy. If you haven't been faithful to life group, I encourage you to get faithful. If you have a life group, I encourage you to grow your life group because I believe that that's God's plan for his local church. The second strategy is when God looks down, he doesn't just look at a local church, but he looks at a local church that's making a global impact. See, church growth is not only what's happening in the sanctuary, but church growth is what's flowing out of the sanctuary. It's not just our seating capacity. Church growth is also our sending capacity. And I came to tell you to be a part of Victor Arch San Diego is to be a part of a church that sends. Look at your name and tell them, we send. We send, we send out, we send out. Think about all the people we have out right now. Think about the students that are in the UTC right now. We sent them to be trained, to get a hold of God, to get a hold of God's purpose for their life. We're believing that when they come back, they're going to come back on fire for the Lord. How many believe that? They're going to they're help us build. They're going to help us build. What about Africa? Sammy and Daniela. Isn't that powerful? 
They're out there with their little family, and they're making an impact with students from all the world, and also in Africa. God is using them in many ways. What about Michelle Castillo over there in Chicago? What about Gary and April up in Sacramento? He called me this week, and he said, Pastor, I want you to know, we got our building. It's going to seat 400 people. Come on, somebody. So God hasn't called us just to grow what's happening here, but he's called us also to send. What about our finances? What about our money? Right now, we've raised, I think, $70,000 for Run for Hope, and we still got a week left. Come on, somebody. We're going to raise over $100,000 to plant churches around the world. You ought to get excited about it. If you can't get excited about it, you haven't caught the vision yet. We are not called just to reach San Diego. We're called to reach the entire world for Jesus. There's a strategy. Somebody say strategy. So we, we recognize that in order to be that church, we got to be that army. Everybody say army. army. We're seeing that now. We're seeing how we're moving. We're a family that's moving as an army. We're, we're, we're functioning in world missions. We, we have our, we're functioning effectively in our organizational structure. We're, we're effective. When we go to conference, we have a financial base. We're pouring out financial resources. We're sending workers. But here's what you need to understand. People are watching us. People are watching us. And, and as a church, we've got to be a little bit more mindful about that. A little bit more mindful about the testimony of our church. A little bit more mindful about what leaders we raise up in our church. You know, if you, if you have a leader there that doesn't think much of the church here, don't raise them up. Don't use them to preach. Don't, don't platform somebody that doesn't agree with what God is doing right here in San Diego. You got some people who are here. They come every week. They, we feed them. We train them. We bear for them. And they talk bad about the church. Don't use those people, please. Because those people send out the wrong message. We, we've got to find people in our church, in our midst, that are loyal to the army. That love the vision. They love their founders. They love their pastors. They're loyal to the leaders of this church. They know how to fall into rank. Now, I don't talk like this all the time, but we're coming out of a summer where we've been doing battle. And you do have some people here that, that it, when times get tough, they don't batten down the hatches. They don't stay at their post. They jump ship. And we need some loyal leaders at Victory Outreach San Diego. Come on, somebody. We need some leaders that are loyal. So don't use people that are not a part of the army that violate those values. How many can say Amen. Because we're an army, then also we're a team. Someone say team. team. See, think of strategy now. Is this too strong for you? Now, if you're new, you say, whoa, this is heavy. Well, that's what tonight's about. This is how you build a church. Team. Everybody say team. Team, team is the idea of growing the ministries necessary to build the army. Growing the ministries necessary to build the army. God has given us core ministries. We have United We Can, we have Gang, we have Veti, we have Women in Ministry, and we have our recovery homes. Amen. And we have Kids Gang. They're downstairs. No, Regina's here. Those are the core ministries. Do you know how important these ministries are? And then now we have our Spanish. Santo, gloria a Dios. Su nombre, Cristo. Do you, do you know how important, and the music, we have a lot of ministries. You don't have to shout for a minute. Do you know how important it is to grow these ministries with a conviction? Do you know that as leaders, if you're in a ministry and you're on the team, you can't slack? You can't get weak? You can't wave the white flag. Do you know how necessary it is to keep these ministries moving in order for the church to be the church that God has called it to be? Yeah. See, it's important that we begin to see a greater commitment in the leaders who are involved in these particular ministries. How can we reach children if we don't have faithful children's workers? How can we see men and women coming out of the home unless we have leaders that are really committed 
to developing the men and the women, not just getting them free from drugs, but developing them into disciples for the glory of Jesus Christ. I believe God's, God's got a calling on them. How can we set an atmosphere and an environment unless we have people on the music team who are not emotional? Up one day, gone day, up one day, up. Jesus, Lord. How is a people like that going to lead you into the presence of God? We, we need loyalty. We need commitment. You know what we need in the ministries? We need strength. We need strength. We need people that understand the role that that ministry plays so that the church could be everything that God has called us to be. Where do you think the people are going to come that are going to come in the harvest? Where do you think they're going to come? They're going to come into the ministries. If those kids come into the kids gang and they're not happy, their parents aren't going to stay. I thank God that we have the best children's team in all of Victory Outreach. I believe it. You should see Regina. She's here at the office every day. She's like the Peanuts gang in front of that computer, planning, planning. She's such a great leader. I thank God we have the best United We Can coordinator, Tracy. You know, I could go on and on. I don't want to puff everybody up. Stay humble now. But there is a work to be done. And when these people come into the church, they want to come to a ministry that has it together. Can I hear an amen? So we've got to be committed. We've got to grow the ministry. Tell your neighbor, grow the ministry. And then the third thing that's important is not only that we're an army and a team, but lastly and most importantly, I believe this is the most important thing tonight, is the family environment. The family environment environment. I want to tell you that to be the Victorious Church that God has called us to be, we must protect the family environment. We must protect the family environment. And I want to tell you, in order to develop a stronger family environment as the church grows, we, we, we've got to provide an environment, an atmosphere, a setting where people can be reached, established, encouraged, and discipled. We have to establish a place, someone say a place, where people could be reached, established, encouraged, and disciples. And I believe that takes place in people's homes. I believe that it's not by coincidence that God, uh, when, he, when, he, when he sent Jesus and, and they started the first church in Acts, that it began from house to house. It began from house to house. God's plan for the church to grow is house to house. Someone say house to house. See, because when you're in a home, that's where the family spirit is alive. That's where the family spirit is alive. That's where the safety of family can be felt. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A, a friend loves at all times, but a brother. See, friendship is just level one. We're trying to go from friendship into brotherhood. We're trying to go from friendship into sisterhood. Come on, somebody. We, we don't want to just say, hey, that's my friend. You know, if I'm close to you and you call me your friend, I'm offended. I want to be your brother. I want to be family. Somebody say family. So we want to move our, our people from being friends to being family. Someone say family. But what does it say here? It says a brother or a sister is born for adversity. So let me tell you something about family. Family's not always blood. Family's not always blood. I think I could say that in our church because some of us, we come from some families that, whoo, my God. Come on, somebody. It's not that you don't love them, but you know they, they had ice cold water flowing through their veins. But when you found a spiritual family, when you found the family of God, come on, somebody. When you found the people of God, when you walked into a group of people that had power, had purpose, had a destiny, had a God that was moving within their life, you found exactly what you needed. I came to tell you, people want to walk with us. People want to journey with us. People want to go where we're going. We got to be ready. But when, when does the spirit of family come alive? It comes alive during difficulty. It comes alive during difficulty. You know someone's family when tough times hit. 
Because when tough times hit, you have some people that walk out of your life, but then you have some people that walk closer to you. And one thing we're seeing in, 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 in the church is that in order for this church to go to another level, we've got to begin to develop environments where people feel like they have spiritual support when times are tough. When times are tough. And how many of you have been serving God a little while? Tough times are going to come. Tough times are going to come. Tough seasons are going to come. Problems are eventually going to arise. But you can be sure that you're going to make it, that if you're walking not only with God. See, some people say, all I need is God. Okay, go ahead and believe that. But it's not just walking with God. It's walking with God's people. It's walking with a people of purpose. It's walking with a people that you are connected with, not only relationally, but people you are connected with spiritually. And what we want is we want to connect people not just to Jesus. We want to connect people to you. We want to connect people to your group. We want to connect people to the power. The same power that broke you through is the same power you're going to teach them to break into. Can I hear an amen? Come on, somebody. We are a family, and we need leaders to raise up that will facilitate the family. That's why the groups are so important. I believe if you want to be used in this church, you need to be in a group. You, some of you need to lead a group. Some of you need to open up your home to a group. And some of you that have groups, you need to become more faithful to your group. Because we're counting on you. We're depending on you. We have an investment in you. We have a trust in you. We have a belief in you. We have said, hey, listen, do you have the vision? You said, yes, you vowed to have the vision. So now we expect you to take care of the people that God has given you in that group. Love those people. Be there for those people. Pray for those people. Visit those people in the hospital. Go to their funerals. Go to their weddings. Go to their quinceañeras. Come on, somebody. Go to their birthday parties. Love somebody. Love somebody. Somebody. Love somebody. Come on and give God a praise. Love somebody. Win people to the Lord. Win people to the Lord. How many think I'm on the money here tonight? See, our groups are the strategy that's going to help us take the ministry to another level. You say, why? Why do you want to grow the church, Pastor? Because you want to have a big crowd? Is that why? Because you want to be big time and have a big crowd? Because people think that sometimes. Is it because you want to be a famous pastor and you know, write books and all that kind of thing? Well, I want to write a book, but not for that reason. I want to grow the church is because the richest place in the world is not the Federal Reserve. We were in New York, and we drove right by the Federal Reserve. You know where they're keeping El Chapo? Right by the Federal Reserve. Because they know ain't no one going to steal that money, so Chapo ain't getting out. Amen. All the money in the United States, most of it is stored at the Federal Reserve in New York City. And I want to tell you something. The richest place in the world is not the Federal Reserve. The richest place in the world is the graveyard. The richest place in the world is the prison system. And so many people who had potential never reached their full potential because they didn't have somebody that took the time to believe in them, to love them, to coach them, to train them, to tell them the truth when they needed to hear it. Come on, somebody, to help them in a time of need. I don't want to grow a big church just to have a bunch of people, a bunch of square people. I want to harvest the potential out of the inner cities of the world. There could be somebody that God is going to use to take a city. There could be somebody that God's going to use to take a country. There could be somebody that God's going to use to take a continent. And we've got to go get them. We got to get them. We got to get them. And we got to train them and we got a disciple come on and give God a praise right now if you understand what I'm saying you can't let the harvest die in the graveyard
some of them are putting a needle in their arm right now. Some of them are smoking on that glass pipe right now. And now is the time. This is a season where God wants to use us to go out and bring them in. They want to walk with us. They want to learn what God is doing in our life. Is there anyone here tonight that says, I'm ready, Pastor? I'm catching this vision. Oh, come on and clap. Come on and praise them if you know what I'm talking about. We got to get out there. The harvest is coming. I declare to you the harvest is coming. It's on its way. I'm going to preach a little more. It's coming. It's not about just building a big church. It's about teaching people three things. Write this down. Number one, it's about teaching and calling people to believe. I, I tell you this, they already want to believe. They're just looking for the real thing. They've been, they've experienced the faith. They've experienced, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about church people, man. Proclaimed to be real, but they're not the real thing. Growing up in church and they've been polluted by the problems of the church and all these other oh, churches got a lot of problems. No, the church ain't got no problems. You got problems. You've just been hanging out with the wrong people. You don't want to hang out with the leaders. So we got to call people to believe. Can I hear an Amen. There's people that want to believe. There's people that say, I want to, I want to believe. I want, I want to get a hold of God in my life. I want to get a hold of the word. I want to get a hold of the vision. Somebody say amen. amen. And we've got to call them, and we've got to challenge them, and we've got to show them what it means to believe by walking in belief for ourselves. Walking in belief for ourselves. Let them see you worshiping God in tough times. Let them see you sitting in that same chair every week, sometimes with a smile on your face, but sometimes with tears flowing down your eyes. Have you seen me do that? I'm your pastor. I've been with you a long time. Have you seen me worship God in tough times? Have you seen me stand over here sometimes walking, sit in that chair, lift up my hands? And have you seen me wiping tears from my eyes because the devil's been on my back and the enemy's been coming against me? But I have learned how to worship God in tough times. I've learned how to lift up my hands to God. I've learned how to keep God. Come on, somebody. Have you seen your pastor do it? Have you seen me be faithful when I didn't feel like being faithful? Come on, somebody. Have you seen me fight the enemy on the front lines? Well, we need some leaders that will worship God at all times. They've got to see us believing. They've got to see us praying. See us pressing them with God. See us praying for our families. See us battling in the spirit realm. They've, they've got to see us also leading others to Christ and compelling them to come in. Being a witness. Calling many people to belief. Somebody say amen. amen. So if, if you're a life group leader, if you're, if you're, if you're a group, and you're in a group, understand what we're learning Learning to pray, learning to worship, learning to serve God daily. Second thing is we need to give them a sense of belonging. That's what makes this whole thing work, is when somebody has a sense of belonging. Understand that this is the spirit of the house. This is the spirit of who we are. We want you to feel like you belong here. Can I hear an amen? That when you walk up to this church, you say, this is my church. There was a man in this church serving the Lord for many years since gone on to be with the Lord and people were leaving and people were acting crazy and the church was going through a heavy storm and he would stand up here and say, this is my church. So I'm not leaving this church. I'm not going to go over here when I'm mad and go over here when I'm not feeling good. I'm not going to be a ranker. This is my church. You got to determine that in your heart. I'm not going to flirt with other ministries and do all that kind of thing. Come on, somebody. Someone say, this is my church. This is, this is where I belong. This is the place where I have relationship. This is the place where I have relationship. This is the place where I grow in fellowship. This is the place where I'm nurtured. This is the place where I'm cared for. This is the place where my needs are met. This is the place where the word of God is growing me. This is the place where I, 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 I'm learning. This is the place where I'm getting stronger. Now, now if you're here and you say, oh, that's none of that, then maybe this is not where you belong. Maybe you got to go to a ministry where we can. Let me talk to you. I received something. We said we saw others how to belong here. You got to receive the harvest and not just teach them how to belong. 
But you have to be able to challenge them to become. To become. As leaders, we have to receive these people and not be ashamed to bring their life into a place of a I believe it's fair. I'm making a statement to you. I believe it's fair that if you're spending time with somebody and you're investing your time, you're taking away from your family time, you're, you're taking away from your personal time with God or, or with your own, and you're giving yourself to somebody, I believe it's fair to eventually get to a place where you challenge them and they receive it. How do you know you have a disciple? is when you see how they respond to your challenge. When Jesus had his disciples, he says, are you going to leave me too? He wasn't afraid to give them hard sayings. He wasn't afraid to give them hard challenges because he slept with them, ate with them, spent time with them for three and a half years of his life. Jesus wasn't playing no games. He says, I'm raising me up an army, and I can't have a bunch of flakes, so this army will not expand. And as leaders, we, we have to... Take on the challenge to bring their life into accountability and bring their life into growth. You, you need to be able to say to people, have I proven my love to you? Have I proven my love to you? I was there with you in the hospital. Have I proven my love to you? I believed in you when nobody else believed in you. Have I proven my love to you? I counseled your marriage. Have I proven my love to you? Have I, I, I will pray for your children, and they don't hear me pray, but you're praying at home for the children. You're pr have I proven my love to you? I've liked every one of your stupid Instagram posts. Have I proven my love to you? <laughs> I've given you money. Have I proven my love to you? I invited you to my home and ate at my table. Have I proven my love to you? I drove you in my car with me, and I took you out to eat, and we went to a conference. Have I proven my love to you? And if people say, you have not proven me my love, then get out of my car and give me a disciple that will receive the love that God has to give them through my life. That's what we need in this church. We need some leaders that are going to challenge people to go to another level of accountability. Give God a praise if you got that. Come on in. Give God a praise if you're ready to challenge somebody. Now, if you haven't invested in them, you can't challenge them. You know, if you just, hey, God bless you. Come over here. Let me rebuke you real quick. No, they're going to leave. But if you've made the investment, how many have made the investment? Only a few of you? I'm talking about you've invested in people. Let me see your hand. You're up. All right. So don't shy away from challenging them, watch this, to become everything God has called them to be. Because in the end, you're not challenging them for you. You're pulling their potential out of the graveyard. Pull that needle out of your arm. God's called you to be a preacher. Get that pipe out of your mouth. You're called to be a husband, a father. You're pulling their potential out of the graveyard. Come on, somebody. Don't shy away from it now. Don't be sheepish with it now. That's what they do in those other churches. But we are Victory Outreach. We're called to raise up disciples. Sit him down and tell him, let me break this down for you, Jack. He 
You didn't spend a whole year in the home to go back to your vomit. You didn't go to the UTC to come back and get disgruntled with the church. What's the matter with you? It's time to pull your potential out of the graveyard. It's time to pull your potential out of the prison system. God has a plan for you. God has a destiny for you. God's going to use you. raising an army that's a family we're raising an army that's a family can they come to the keyboard give God a praise everybody we're raising an army how do we do this as we close did you get something tonight there's four very important things number one we need to raise the right leadership and, and, and I'm in that right now I'm closing the books because we need to take a look at our leadership we have now and say, is this the right leadership? I think we have it. But I think some of our leaders need to be reminded, reminded of what our mission is all about. We want to raise the right leadership. We want to raise the people who can teach and communicate the word of God effectively. We want to raise leaders who have the heart of the ministry, the heart of the house, and the heart of the pastor. We need that. We need leaders that are not just submitted to Christ, but we need leaders who are submitted to the vision of the house. Okay? Now, a disciple is someone who's committed to Christ, submitted to Christ. But a leader, somebody say leader, is submitted to Christ and the vision of the house. You say, well, I don't receive that. Okay? Well, you do it at your job. If you work for Orkin, you don't walk in wearing Terminex. They say, boy, you're going to flip your, what's the matter with you? You're part of this organization, not that one. Well, I ain't going to work today. Give me my check. They say, you must be crazy. You, 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 pay, you made a vow to work for us. There was an NFL player today. Did you hear about that? In the middle of the game. He's a defensive player. His team was losing so badly, and they're always losing. In the middle of the game, he took his uniform off, walked into the locker room, and said, I'm retiring today. I'm not playing for this team no more. The game was still going. Got in his car and left. Now, I know some people say, man, that, that's true, man. He shouldn't be playing for that horrible team. Oh, they're ripping this boy. They're saying, they, they gave you $1.2 million. You better put that uniform on and get back on the field or give the money back. Because when you're a leader, you're not just submitted to Christ. You're submitted to the vision of the organization you serve. You won't get a lot of claps on it, but that's, that's a fact, Jack. And if you don't like it, try to tell your boss. They'll fire you like that. So we need the right leadership. Can I hear an amen? Don't raise up people that don't have this vision. Wait on it. Let, wait till they catch the vision. Amen? Then we got to reach people. That's the second thing. Then the third thing is we need to repair lives. That's what I think we're getting excited about. And then lastly, here's the key. Retain growth through relationship. Go ahead and stand with me. Retain growth through relationship. Retain the growth. I, I refuse to accept that Victory Outreach is just a salvation ministry. I just refuse to, re refuse to accept that. And I'll tell you why. Primarily because that's not the calling God has placed on my life. And I know there's some pastors, they feel fine, you know. Well, as long as you guys say the Victory Outreach. The good thing about getting saved in Victory Outreach is that Victory Outreach will always be a part of your testimony. Unless you lie. You know, if you got saved in VO, baptized in VO, given the foundation in VO, and then you leave VO, well, you know, eventually the conversation is going to say, where did you get saved? You know, you know, oh, I got saved in VO. You know, unless you lie and say, well, you know, I led myself to the Lord. I was in a program. You know. <laughs> but 
But I refuse to accept that because that's not the calling on me. I'm called to raise up leaders. I feel comfortable in that calling. I feel secure in that calling. And that's what I feel is God's calling on my life. And, 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 and I, I'm not just saying that like to say it. I'm saying it because there's been fruit and evidence of that. But if the calling is on me, then the calling is also on you. And what we want to do is we not just want to reach the people. We want to also keep the people. And then not only keep the people, we want to train the people and build the people up. And then eventually, if it be God's will, send them out. Send them to a city that God could use them to shake that city. Or if they say, well, I'm not called to go past some phone. Well, then praise God. You're going to be a part of helping us to send them out. But I understand the calling on my life, and I want you to understand it for yourself. And I believe that we're called not just to reach them, but to, but to retain them, to disciple them, and to raise them up. And then ultimately, maybe, possibly, if it be God's will, to release them into a mission. I make you say amen. So you hearing what I, my heart tonight? How many receive this word? Receive this word.